the agenda for today is as follows. So Keith, uh, we have Keith here with us today. Um, he's very active in Silicon Valley, co-founded TechCrunch. He also had the first internet cafe uh, in the UK um, and he serves as an investor, um, as, a, as a coach for startups. Um, and I would like to encourage you to post questions uh, on the Slido link uh, during the session as well. Um, and we have like 20 minutes with him today and then 10 minutes uh, for a short Q&A. All right. Um, so again, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And I suggest we get going. We have uh, 5.32 nearly. So I'd like again to welcome you. We're very happy today that Keith here took some time. Uh, he's located in Palo Alto, California. And I will hand over to you, Keith. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Giovanni. Um, so I think what, what, just to begin, it's important, and probably the people listening understand Silicon Valley, but just in case, let me briefly explain that Silicon Valley always lives in the future. Um, people get paid for guessing the future. And um, most of the, the, the investors, their business model uh, deploys capital and expects a return seven to 10, maybe even as long as 15 years from now. So the, the job is not to identify what is working today. The job is to identify what will be working around five years from now that could be uh, producing uh, an exit for the investors between seven and let's say 12 years from now. So what's hot in Silicon Valley is always a, a symptom of that view of the future. Um, now, of, of course, in normal business, <clears throat> this year is important. We all have P&Ls and balance sheets, but in Silicon Valley, we don't, we have funds. So this year is about the least interesting thing to us. Uh, we're only interested in, in what will happen next. Now, now in that regard, um, you know, obviously different investors have different focuses, but I think blockchain belongs broadly speaking in that area of focus called FinTech, financial technology. And it, it deals with very, very large macro themes. For example, um, you know, we saw with Libra, the reaction of the central banks to the idea that a software company could create a currency. Um, and um, of course, in the short term, that's a major issue if you're a central bank. If, if you're an investor, um, it's a, a very significant long-term conversation whether nation states will survive globalization. Um, uh, if you think about nation states, they're historically very recent. Um, you, you know, Germany was only created uh, not very long ago. Uh, I'm not talking about the reunification, I mean the original Germany. Um, and um, uh, before that, we had city states who had currencies uh, who disappeared as nation states arose. And now we have global entities whose membership base is bigger than the largest country. And, and so Silicon Valley asked the question, um, what is the future of money? It, it, and what is the future of nations? Um, obviously the world asked that question after, you know, 1945 and things like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were created. And in the International Monetary Fund, they already have a global, um, a global uh, fake currency called XDRs, which stands for special drawing rights. So, so for about 80 years, the world has been um, through the normal channels of nations asking the question, what, what will the, the global world look like? So Silicon Valley is really focused on that question. Now, as you begin to address that question, you get to some subordinate questions, things like, what is the role of a retail bank? Um, things like uh, custodial services. Will, will you need a bank account to store your value. 
And the most likely answer is no. So will you need a bank to make a loan to you? Probably not. So then, you know, the investors are saying, well, if banks won't survive or will become uh, unnecessary, what will replace them? And whatever that is, I want to invest in that because wherever the money is flowing is, is where the profit is to be made. So in Silicon Valley, it feels as if uh, the very structure of the world, nation states, and then within nation states, the relationship between central banks and, and uh, retail banks um, is being called into question. When, when that happens, um, well, that's both an opportunity and a problem for a central bank. Um, actually, a central bank doesn't need retail banks either. Um, a, a central bank with its own with its own currency, if it were able to distribute money and and account for its movement, um, it too would not need retail banks. And, and 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 of course, retail banks are a massive point of failure in the national system, as we saw in two thousand and eight. Yeah. Um, um, so so I think the the other thing that um, Silicon Valley is interested in is what will be the, what, what will be the relationship uh, in the time when nation states are still minting their token, their, their currency, between um, a digital national currency, which, by the way, is assumed to be inevitable. Mm -hmm. Digital national currency is, is assumed to be inevitable. I'm not completely convinced that China is as far along in being the first to do that as everyone thinks, but it may be. Um, but every central bank is talking about that, which would, of course, reduce the cost of printing notes and minting coins. Uh, uh, of, course, of course, as we've seen in India, uh, the digitization of identity and money does lead to all kinds of issues. For example, what if you're poor and you don't have a smartphone? Uh, uh, how will you spend and transact? Sure. So it's not without issues, but it does seem inevitable that there will be digital national currencies. Um, and if that's true, then nation states and central banks then have to answer a second question is, how do these currencies flow across borders and at what cost to the owner? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, if there isn't a good answer to that, then companies like TransferWise and others uh, will dominate. Uh, I have a bank account with Revolut in the UK. Uh, I have Swiss francs, euros, pounds, and dollars. I can move them pretty much for free and spend them off the same credit card wherever I travel. Um, it seems that that is the model of the future. And it, it also seems that in a digital currency world, a central bank could enable models like that. Um, so, so I think, uh, I think, I think, um, I think the default belief in Silicon Valley is that a third party digital currency that is global will win. Okay. And that central banks will be a little bit like telephone companies are in relationship to the internet. Um, you know, in 1994, when I started EasyNet in London, uh, British Telecom was our competitor, and we were a tiny company, uh, but no one would imagine the internet could beat British Telecom in terms of delivering services to the world. Uh, uh, I, I do believe that uh, a digital currency is, you know, in, in, in embryonic form, is, is um, uh, as it globalizes in particular, is um, as, as dangerous to the banking system, including central banks, as the internet was to telephone companies. Now, as it turns out, telephone companies embraced the internet and survived. True. Yeah. Uh, so central banks also can embrace and survive, but they, do, they probably can slow down as well uh, these developments, mm -hmm. but they, they can't, they probably can't stop them. So embrace and survive is probably the right, 
if you like, the right campaign slogan for a central bank um, that wants to survive. I don't think that fully addresses the very long term, and by the very long term, maybe I mean 100 years, when I think the human race questions the logic of nation states. As less and less things we do are controllable by nation states, tax collection is a good example of that. As less and less things are, are doable, it might be rational for a single global economic system with a single set of citizens to uh, uh, um, uh, transact with each other without borders being an issue. Um, that may well be true. That doesn't mean governance will go away. In that world, governance survives, but it probably becomes much more local mm -hmm. um, in cities and towns and so on. Um, and global things are probably run on computers with rules, um, possibly with some AI, um, that uh, efficiently allocates resources and, and so on and so forth. So now I'm starting to sound kind of crazy as if this is an episode of Star Trek. But Silicon Valley, that's how we think. We, 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 we really try to figure that stuff out. And, um, my, you know, my personal opinion, and uh, give me a time check if I'm speaking too long here, but uh, my personal opinion is the right thing to do now as an individual is to begin to put um, your assets in a store of value that is safe in the context of a fairly unstable world. So the dollar, it seems to me, will not be uh, a currency of world trade as China gets stronger, as Asia gets stronger. Um, it feels that the United States will play the role that Great Britain played um, between the wars and after the Second World War in being a declining uh, asset looked at from the point of view of the global population. The, the, the United States, therefore, its currency um, will be less and less capable of, of supporting the trust that people put in them. Uh, and and uh, it feels like the rise of China is not ever going to stop in, the, in our lifetime. Um, the domestic economy of China alone means that it is um, world trade issues don't impact it. Um, uh, the consumer spending will just go up and up as the middle class grows. China's influence in the Asia region initially will uh, allow it to grow beyond its own borders. And it, it, it will become the biggest world power the world has ever seen. Um, now, I, I did a lot, you know, it, it, so, so the impact of that on um, global currencies is massive. Uh, I don't think anyone believes the RMB will become a reserve currency or the reserve currency. So I don't think anyone believes we'll go back to the gold standard or an arrangement like Bretton Woods. Mm. So then the issue is what, what will be the, you know, the intermediate step between the dollar and what replaces it? What will the world do to create stable, uh, a stable global economic system with the ability to um, uh, transfer assets between nations to pay bills. Um, what will that be? I just lost you. Uh, but I think you can still hear me, right? Uh, Giovanni, tell okay. me if you can still hear me. We're back, we're back in. Maybe he I can hear you again and yeah. see you again. Uh, would you mind repeat, uh, repeating starting from uh, Bretton Woods? Yeah, so what I was, what I was saying is that um, as China grows and, and relatively speaking, the USA declines, and I, I emphasize relative, I mean, Brit Britain declined many, many decades ago and is still a very modern wealthy economy so these declines are not absolute but it, but in global terms in world economic terms it's really important these relative changes are massive and if so if the dollar uh, uh, 
it can't be the reserve currency of the world in the basket it currently dominates. And if China can't replace it due to all kinds of issues, mainly political, um, then what will be, you know, the equivalent of what happened when the pound declined, which was the gold standard and Bretton Woods? Sure. What will be the modern equivalent of that? And it seems that digital currencies are a big part of the answer. They have to be. Right. Um, uh, and, and so this isn't just a central bank issue. This is a global issue uh, for all central banks. I think, I think it also, um, this is a subordinate point, but let's say you live in Zimbabwe and your national currency is completely untrustworthy as a store of value. Sure. Um, how, does the, how do your citizens maintain their relative wealth in the world? Uh, it can only really be through plugging into a, a store of value that is not susceptible to the same fluctuations as your national currency. Now, I, I suspect that out of over 200 countries in the world, uh, well over 150 of them are in that situation where their national currency simply isn't a good store of value for the long run. Uh, so, it, it, you know, in a way, the UK and Germany, uh, 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 the Eurozone, and the US and China, we're all fairly privileged, Japan, in that our currencies are somewhat stable. But that isn't true for most of the world. Mm -hmm. and, become, and, and it becomes less true as you get 2 billion people in Africa and 6 billion in Asia, uh, we become the minority. Yeah. Um, and, and so what we think is the right way to do the global economic system is going to diverge a lot from what is the rational thing to do at a global level. Okay. So I think those are the kind of issues that, that we think about. Uh, what, what's hot is what comes next. Okay. If you reduce it down to a single sentence. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, that's very interesting. I already see that there are a good few questions. So I would like to start uh, with the Q&A session. Uh, so one question considering uh, digital currency is, in the field of digital currency, which components are needed by the market most? Custody services, secure wallets, reliable exchange services, or just better UX? Well, better UX is always needed. Um, yeah. I have a very good friend. Uh, a very good friend of mine is a guy called Alex Komarov, who you will be able to tell is Russian. He lives in Australia. And he just designed the new wallet for um, for the Ethereum Foundation, and okay. he's a UX guy. And he removed most of the weirdness surrounding having a wallet and needing to uh, manage it. Um, so I think UX is always an issue. Uh, the thing, the thing we, we most need is stable stores of value. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, Bitcoin clearly is not a stable store of value in the short term. In any short term period, it's hardly volatile. Um, the same for Ethereum. So I think a stable store of value is, is, is the first thing. And that gives people a way to be sure that uh, their money will not decline faster than their national currency, but it also won't increase faster than their national currency. Um, it, uh, so most of the stable coins are kind of interesting in that regard. Um, I, I think the, um, the second thing is the tokenization of assets. Um, Liquidity is, 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 is um, for most assets, is very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, so, example, uh, I own a house. I own about 90% of my house. 10% uh, is a mortgage. But I can't spend the 90% that I don't own uh, in, in any rational way. I have to take out a high-interest loan if I want to do that. Um, or, I, or I have to um, do, you know, uh, get, get a second mortgage and so on and so forth, which is also very expensive. Um, but now, now that we're uh, we're introducing this concept called uh, DeFi, 
um, DEFI, um, you're beginning to be able to store assets in vaults and draw cash down from those assets um, and, and, and pay it back. I think that's step one. I think step two is the full tokenization of the asset. So let's use my house as an example. If my house was worth, you know, $100,000 and I could create uh, $1,000 tokens, 100 of them, and let's say I could sell two of them, and now somebody owned 20% of my house. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I got the cash, uh, but I hadn't sold the home. I'd sold a token that represents the value of my home. Um, uh, that could work for commercial real estate. It could work for works of art. It could work for any stable asset, or, uh, and certainly any appreciating asset over a very long period and would be as, as, as secure as, say, a bond is today from a government. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think a tokenization of assets where securitization wouldn't really work, it's not like you can do a public offering for your house, um, but I think tokenization could work. So I think we're going to see all kinds of new financial instruments that release liquidity um, Another example, I'm, I'm an investor in lots of private companies. In, in Berlin, I'm an investor in a company called Infarm, which has raised 100 million euros last time it raised money for vertical farming. Um, those shares I own are private and therefore not tradable unless I do a private deal. I, I think um, liquidity will come to the uh, uh, you know, it, it will go deeper than the stock exchange down to the next level of successful companies, and we will find tokenization of securities happening as well. Um, so I, I think that's interesting. I don't worry too much about exchanges. That, that, you know, Binance and Coinbase, I think exchanges will just evolve and get better and better and more and more trustworthy. I, it's really not, to me, the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, Reg national regulations are a bigger problem. So the SEC in the USA is only slowing down and making it less likely that the United States will be a center for whatever comes next. Um, they're so fearful of rule breaking that they are not making new rules that, you, that fit uh, what people are doing anyway. And, and so I feel as if um, national regulatory frameworks, we all have seen what has been happening in Switzerland, for example, or Malta um, or, or Gibraltar. So if national regulatory frameworks don't align, then there'll be all these very strange kind of breakout countries that become the center of gravity for what's new. Um, so it feels as if um, value will escape the primary economies unless they create rule-based frameworks for digitization. Okay. I'll stop there because I'm answering too long. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, uh, so two more questions that we have here. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, could you share your perspective on the Lightning protocol from Bitcoin? Um, it's a little bit early to, to be sure about the Lightning protocol, but the underlying assumption with the Lightning Protocol is that Bitcoin should be a means of exchange and therefore should be capable of being spent for products and services. And I, for one, do not see Bitcoin as a very viable means of exchange. I, I think Bitcoin is closer to gold. It's like a store of value. <clears throat> and you can, um, it, it's, it, just like gold, it's also a speculative store of value. Its value will go up and down over time. And something that is speculative and volatile is really bad as a means of exchange. Therefore, the Lightning Network, which addresses how many simultaneous transactions the network can support and how expensive it will be to support them, I think is targeting um, a use case for Bitcoin that I doubt will happen, um, which is a means of exchange. Uh, so, so, uh, so in that sense, obviously all innovation is good, but, um, um, and, you know, the network being faster is good, 
um, and you know, there's nothing bad to say about it. I think it's just based on a false premise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so one more question. Um, do you see an, another store of value that you can recommend? Like you, you say, uh, Bitcoin isn't one. What are the other um, stores of value that you could recommend, for instance? Um, well, it, it depends on your goals. Um, if your goal is maintenance of assets mm -hmm. or growth of assets, you would choose different stores of value. So you, you've got to start with the goal. Um, I, I think the best stores of value are ones that won't decline um, uh, due to random variables. Uh, and so, uh, you know, stores of value which are tied to national currencies like USDT, mm -hmm. probably not that great because the US dollar is not free from the fear that it will decline uh, or that the central bank will print more notes and, and, and decrease the value of each note. Um, so, I, so I think that um, things tied to fiat currencies probably are not great stores of value. Uh, I think uh, stores of value that are tied to real assets are kind of interesting. Um, uh, if you understand the meaning of real assets in the in, in, in um, so uh, I, I, I'd say a prudent store of value is, uh, is a token tied to real assets. Um, if you want to grow, then you've got to bet on the future. You know, a typical Silicon Valley fund is expected to grow about 300% in 10 years. Um, so obviously any store of value tied to a physical asset that will not grow that much is not going to work for you. So what you do is you invest very early in stocks in companies that you think will appreciate. And the new trend is to invest in tokens. So you can see, for example, that the company Definity, which is run by a, a British entrepreneur here in Palo Alto, Definity uh, sold tokens to Andreessen Horowitz, the, the fund. And, and they preferred his tokens to his stock. They believed that the tokens might appreciate more than the stock. So I think then you're in the world of speculation and choice, and you have to choose your assets very carefully like a wealth manager would for risk. Um, and, and those stores of value, you know, uh, uh, um, if you would have invested in Bitcoin in the last 12 months, you'd be very happy right now. Um, if you would have invested in it in uh, 2018 December, you'd be very unhappy right now. Mm -hmm. So, so it, there's massive risk, but obviously uh, lots of reward in stores of value that might appreciate. Okay. All right. And what do you think? When could we see uh, digital currencies in place? In in terms of national government currencies. That's it. Yeah. You know, the the smart money would be on never because the central banks will be too conservative to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think China could possibly change that opinion mm -hmm. because if China does it, then I believe everyone will do it. Um, Libra, it felt to me, was a catalyst for thinking mm -hmm. uh, because clearly it's if an entity with 2.7 billion members released uh, a means of payment that didn't suffer from uh, penalties if you spend it globally uh, and was backed by a basket of currencies, that would in effect be a global currency but without nation state backing. True. Um, and, and, and it would work. It would absolutely work. Um, and it would work better in places that have weak currencies than have strong ones, uh, but that's most of the world. Okay, I see. Um, so, I, so I definitely believe uh, Libra conceptually would work. For, for the central banks to compete, they would have to work together at the global level. Yeah, I think there are initiatives. I think uh, there's the International Bank of Settlements in Basel, uh, in Switzerland, yeah. and they get together with all the 
central bank representatives. And there's a few people, a few organizations already trying to place a central bank digital currency. I think in the Bahamas, yeah. there's a company, so they would like to try that out. Um, also without internet. So if, if, if there's a catastrophe that people can still uh, pay. So that's very interesting to see also the advantages in the long run, also maybe for, for areas in Africa where people don't have access to cash. So that's one of our main topics, access to cash to improve yeah. the CBDC yeah. could be the solution to that. Yeah. If you look at the rise of M-Pesa in Kenya and, and other parts of um, East Africa, um, you can see the, the, how fast that could work. Yeah, true. Um, I should say, I personally don't believe Libra will happen. Um, I think, I think the, the, uh, Facebook made two mistakes. Mm -hmm. The first mistake is they said that they were setting up an independent association to run Libra. But then when governments asked to speak to somebody, Mark Zuckerberg showed up which was obviously not the right group of people to show up if you're, if, if you're not running and owning a currency. They should have had a much stronger management team in the Libra Association, and it should have been discussing with governments, not Facebook. Um, and then secondly, they promised Facebook not to implement unless they got agreement from the regulatory authorities, and of course that's never gonna happen. So, uh, however, if I was those authorities, I wouldn't be too happy about that because the next time somebody thinks about something like Libra, they'll do it differently. Um, and, and the concept is valid. So whoever does it right will probably be successful. Okay. So there's one last question that I would like to ask. Um, how can trust in the value and in the stability of uh, an electronic currency be fostered? Who is most likely the state institution slash organization in charge of it? Well, I, 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 I generally speaking, don't believe that trust in a currency emanates from its ownership. I think it emanates from its use. Um, and tr trust, in a way, is, is proven through use. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. If you look at Bitcoin from that point of view, and you just were to chart the uh, transaction volumes of Bitcoin over the years, um, in the early days, it was like crazy, and none of us would have bought one. Um, and then suddenly it became wow, look what's going on here. And, and then normal people started to buy it. So I think trust and use are correlated. Um, now, obviously, national currencies are very used, and that's why, they're, that's why they're, they're trusted. But I believe that trust is temporary. Um, so, so now what the organization that owns the currency can do is destroy it. They can't make it good, but they can make it bad. And, and they make it bad when, when, for whatever reason, the institution of the state uh, loses it, its trust amongst the people, uh, economic trust, and, and then people will stop using the currency, which will be you know, indica indicative of their lack of trust uh, in the organization that owns it. So I think organizations can do damage, but they can't make something work. Um, the, the thing that makes it work is how it's designed and the use cases it addresses and whether people um, adopt those use cases. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, I think, I think we're good. Uh, all the questions are be, I have been uh, answered. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Keith, maybe one last thing. What do you think, what's, what will be the next, um, Let's say a unicorn in yeah, Silicon Valley. What will it? What, which topic will it? Will it treat? Um, well, there's, you know, there are a lot, a lot of unicorns now every year in the world. And by the way, less and less of them are in Silicon Valley. It's becoming a, a global phenomenon. I think the next unicorn will be Infarm in Berlin. All right. Okay. Okay. They're they're already halfway there, and. Uh, I think they'll raise money this year. I think they'll be the next one.
Okay, how did you get aware of them? Uh, I was the judge at a competition in Japan where the founders were presenting their company and they won uh, five years ago. Okay, I see. All right. Yeah, so it's it's all about timing and being in the right place, also for investor, I suppose. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. So I, I suggest we wrap it up. Keith, very much, uh, very, how to say, infinite thanks for taking the time from Palo Alto today. Um, to the other attendees, thank, thank you all for participating. And I would also encourage you um, to comment the campaign or simply email us uh, to ahead at gi.be.com if you have further questions. And I would like to announce the next expert live session, which is Friday, uh, starting from a quarter to three, which is achieving quick results by running design sprints and lessons learned. Keith, thank you very much. And talk Wir to you soon. Thank you, Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Thank you.